Joshua chapters <coughs> 5 to 8, but 8 at that time. Okay, so we start off with some questions. Who is Joshua? <coughs> and what do we know about him already? I thought before we jump into the Torah portion that we should get a little bit of a head start. So, which tribe was he from? Does anybody know? Boof! From Ephraim. We see that Moshe sends out spies from each tribe, and it says, From the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea, the son of Nun. And you say, Hoshea, who is he? Uh, it says, These were the names of the men whom Moshe sent to spy out the land, and Moshe called Hoshea, the son of Nun, Joshua. So he's from the tribe of Ephraim. Uh, 1 Chronicles 7 20 to 29 lists the descendants of Ephraim, and from this we see who Joshua's grandfather was. Ladani's son, Aham, Aham, Amihud, his son, Elishima, his son, Nun, his son, and Joshua, his son. So, Joshua's grandfather was Elishima. So, who was he? On the west side shall be the standard of the camp of Ephraim by their companies, the chief of the people of Ephraim being Elishima, the son of Amihud. So, he's a chief. Joshua's grandfather was the chief or the prince. The word in the Hebrew is Nasi, the leader, one lifted up of the tribe of Ephraim. We read in Numbers 7, On the seventh day, Elishima, the son of Ah Amihud, the chief or the prince of the people of Ephraim. So there he is. He's mentioned in Scripture. He's, his grandfather is this big chief, this leader. And it was a position that came with great responsibility. In Numbers 10, we read, And the standard of the camp of the children of Ephraim set forward according to their armies, and over his host was Elishima, the son of Amihud. So he's like the leader of the armies of Ephraim. So he oversaw the armies of Ephraim, and throughout Joshua's life, we can see that in the scriptures, he's got really strong role models, even from like looking at who his family was and stuff. And he is his grandfather, is a nasty, and he's the, lead, he's the leader of the armies of Ephraim. The company Joshua kept, if we look at it, he spent loads of time with Moshe. It says in Scripture from his youth he was his assistant. He spent time with Caleb, as we know. <clears throat> Family, well, we know his grandfather was a Nasi and a military leader. And it brings me to this. He that walks with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. He really did keep amazing <laughs> company, Joshua. And scripture greatly encourages keeping good company. 1 Corinthians 15, don't be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. The company you keep is important. Job 15:34, the company of the godless is barren and fire consumes the tents of bribery. And Paul, uh, Psalm 1, 1 to 2 says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the Torah of Yehovah, and on his Torah he meditates day and night. Now the first time we come across Joshua is just after the splitting of the rock in Exodus 17. We find him engaged in a military campaign. So obviously his grandfather being this Nasi and this leader of the hosts of Ephraim would have been really useful for him. And we read, then Amalek, uh, then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And we learn more about the nature of the attack later in the Torah. In Deuteronomy it says, Remember what Amalek did to you on your journey when you left Egypt, for he surprised you and cut down all the stragglers in your rear while you were famished and weary. So Amalek has come and attacked. And this is what we see happening. Moshe said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So the hill Moshe will be standing on is Mount Sinai. Joshua did as Moshe had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moshe, Aharon and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moshe held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moshe, his hands grew weedy, so they took a stone and they put it under him, and he sat on it, while Aharon and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady, 
The word is actually emunah, which is a word for faith. So, faith until the going down of the sun. And Joshua, I think this is a great expression, isn't it? He discomforted Amalek. Oh, you've really discomforted me there. And it's people with the edge of the sword. <laughs> you discomforted me with your sword. So, actually though, it isn't the edge of his sword. The word pay is used. So what it actually says is, Joshua discomforted, weakened Amalek and his people with the sword of his mouth. And obviously, we know from what JP was saying, and we know anyway, but last week's teaching pointed us to it really firmly. Joshua gives us a prophetic picture of Yeshua. We see in Revelation 19.5, Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations, and he should rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And we know what the two-edged sword is that comes out of his mouth, don't we? It's the word. So as we know, it is Joshua who goes on to lead the people into the promised land as well, isn't it? Which again is offering us a picture of Yeshua. And if we consider Joshua as representing Yeshua and Moshe as representing the Torah, it's an interesting picture when we look at the war with Amalek. We've got Moses, which is the Torah, representing the Torah or the book of Moshe, and Joshua, Yeshua, we see that they're working together. Joshua, or Jesus, is obedient to Moses. We see that in verse 10, does what he says. And for victory, the foundation of Moses, the Torah, is the stone which is Messiah. So Yeshua, if we look at him as the stone that the builders rejected. We read in 1 Peter 1, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, which obviously is the word, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls. But the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. JP touched on this last week, didn't he? And in chapter 2 it says, So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up, grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. For the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense and they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. And as we know, disobedience is unbelief. They stumble because they do not obey. They are disobedient. Those who disobey the word stumble as they were destined to do. To them, Yeshua is a stone of stumbling and he is a rock of offense. Just think how many people there are who profess to love Jesus or Yeshua and yet they disobey the word. These people actually find the true Messiah to be a rock of offense, preferring the God of their own imagination in whatever shape, whatever shape, form, or whatever it comes in. To these people, the connections that we see in the war with Amalek are not appreciated. Moshe, the Torah, and Joshua, Yeshua working together. That makes perfect sense, though, doesn't it? When you consider Yeshua is the word made flesh. Yeshua is obedient to Moshe, to the Torah, of course. Sin is transgression of the Torah. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. In him is no sin. Of course, he is going to obey Moshe. And of course, for victory, the foundation of Moshe, the Torah, is the stone Messiah. We read in Galatians 5.4, Christ has become of no effect to you, whosoever you are justified by the law, you were fallen from grace. For all those who think, oh, I don't need the rock, I don't need the stone for victory, and just read what we've just read. For those who have little idea as to who Yeshua is and what we're called to, Peter continues. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Please make note of the fact that we are called to be a holy nation. 
Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you received not mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is quite an incredible calling, isn't it? To be Jehovah's people set apart from all of the world to belong to him. We're called to be his nation, Israel. And just as Joshua led Israel into the land, so Yeshua will lead us into victory. And the next time we read about Joshua, Joshua, he is headed up Mount Sinai with Moshe. And this is just after the covenant is confirmed. It says, And he said unto Moshe, Come up, thou, come up unto the Lord, thou and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And Moshe alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with him. And Moshe came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord had said, so we will do which is their first response. And Moshe wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and builded an altar under the hill and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And I've put the picture in there because I believe that could possibly be the site and this could be part of what was built actually at that time. And he sent young men of the children of Israel which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. And there's another picture of what is believed to be the altar that he might have built. Another picture there. <clears throat> Moshe took half of the blood and he put it in basins and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people and they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and we will be obedient. In the Hebrew, <clears throat> I'm not going to even try. I'm, honestly, I'm so bad at pronunciation. But it reads more like they replied, all that Yehovah has declared... We will asa and we will shema. Important. There was something missing in the people's first response to Yehovah's proposal when they said, "We will do naase. We will asa. We will we will do it. We will build it. We will make it happen." Yehovah had told the people specifically what response was required. He said, "If when you shema and shema my covenant, then you will be my treasured people." my kingdom of priests, and my holy people, which is what we, as we've just seen, are also called to be. So the covenant they have agreed to is that they will shema Yehovah, hearkening to his voice, walking in obedience to him in all things. And it's the same for us, obviously. The Torah is not the covenant. The covenant involved the promise to shema all that Yehovah says, and that obviously includes all of the Torah. That was the first covenant. And the second covenant we have is Torah written on our hearts as we read in Hebrews 8. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them in their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. To shema the master's voice, to do what it is that he says to do. Not to question it, not to think, oh, I might just do a bit of it. And no, no, just to hearken to his voice. To him, the shepherd, Yeshua, the gatekeeper, opens and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. When he's brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. And again, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. Important words, I know them. If you consider what's written in Matthew 7, depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. But it's always been the same, to hearken to his voice. Moshe took the blood and he sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you concerning all these words. And of course, we can see similar language in Matthew 26. Drink it of all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And Moshe and Aharon, Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel, they went up and they saw the God of Israel and there was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone like the very heaven for cleanness, clearness. Rather. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel and they beheld God and they ate and drank. Quite an experience. This must have been remarkable. And Yehovah said to Moshe, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there that I may give you the tablets of stone, which the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. So Moshe rose with his assistant Joshua, and Moshe went up into the mountain of God. So 
Joshua is there this whole time. He's experiencing all these incredible things firsthand as Moshe's assistant. We generally think of Moshe going up the mountain by himself, but verse 13 indicates that his assistant Joshua went with him. Now, I don't know how far up the mountain he went. I don't know anything about that. But all I know is Joshua is at the heart of the action throughout all these events. And we see from verse 13 that Joshua was Moshe's assistant. When I said before, he had good company and he hung around with good people. You can see what I'm getting at. Joshua was right at the heart of the action throughout all these momentous events. And he said to the elders, wait here for us until we return to you. And behold, Aharon and her are with you. Whoever has a dispute, a dispute, let him go to them. Okay? And as we know, it didn't go well, did it? As we read. And Moshe went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of Jehovah dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moshe out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of Jehovah was like a devouring, a devouring fire on the top of the mountain and in the sight of the people of Israel. Moshe entered the cloud and he went up on the mountain and Moshe was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. And then Exodus 31 it says, And he gave to Moshe when he had finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. Now next, we see that Joshua is someone who gets things wrong, right? There he is, he's, his grandfather's this big wig, this big chief. He hangs around as Moshe's assistant. And now we're going we're gonna to hear him speak, and we're going to see how it goes. Now, the fact that he gets things wrong, I think it makes it somewhat easier to identify with him than with Moshe. If you remember when we read the epitaph of Moshe when we finished the book of Deuteronomy, the Lord says there's been nobody like him. Nobody, like, you know, I'll speak face to face with him. Moshe's just like kind of this, wow. But I think it's easier for us to identify with Joshua because of the fact that we will see him make mistakes. And again, Joshua points us to our Messiah in that he is a leader who is able to understand our weaknesses. As we read in Hebrews 14 about Yeshua, we do not have a high priest who was unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Again, Joshua gives us this picture of the Messiah. So Exodus 32, Then Moshe turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, tablets that were written on both sides, on the front and on the back, they were written. The tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moshe, there is a noise of war in the camp. And then, <laughs> it's just like the first time we hear him speak. He said, it's not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing that I hear. So it's the first time we hear Joshua speak, and he gets it wrong. And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moshe's anger burned hot and he threw the tablets of, out of his hand and broke them at the foot of the mountain. Again, Joshua, right there at the heart of all these events, Joshua keeps the best of company. He that walks with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Let that sink in. That could just be like a soundbite that passes you by and you don't even think much about it, but let it really sink in. Joshua has a truly incredible apprenticeship. It's remarkable when, I, obviously, we've gone through the Torah and we get to know these things, like, because there's a bit about him there and there's a bit about him here. But when you pile it all together, it's like, wow, what a picture. Exodus 33. Now, Moshe used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought Yehovah would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moshe went out to the tent, all the people would rise up and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moshe until he had gone into the tent. When Moshe entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent and Yehovah would speak with Moshe. Wow. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship each at his tent door. Thus, Yehovah used to speak to Moshe face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Amazing. 
And then the verse continues. When Moshe turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Wow. So where's Joshua? And he's actually, again, right at the heart of all that is going on. Moshe speaks face to face. The Lord speaks to him as to a friend. And even when Moshe goes, Joshua stays behind in this tent. Described again, obviously, here is Moshe's assistant. And we see that Joshua would have spent much time in Yehovah's presence around all these events that we read about. So Joshua is the grandson of the prince of Ephraim. He's a young man and he's a warrior. He spends lots of time with Moshe and in Yehovah's presence. And he's somebody who gets things wrong. The second time we hear Joshua speak, it goes about as well as the first time. Numbers 11. So Moshe went out and told the people the words of Yehovah, and he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tent. Then Yehovah came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied in the word that is Nabah, but they did not continue doing it. Okay, Nabah. The last time I covered this, I have a habit of like having dyslexia and I put it was H5102, it's not, it's H5012. And it means this word prophesied in the back, it means to speak as the Spirit gives utterance. Now two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the Spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent. And so they prophesied in the camp, they spoke as the Spirit gave them utterance. And a young man ran and told Moshe, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moshe from his youth, said, My Lord, Moshe, stop them. Okay. <laughs> but Moshe said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all Jehovah's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. And Moshe and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. I imagine Joshua probably felt a little bit deflated after that. He probably thinks, Moses is going to think I'm brilliant saying this. <laughs> and he just like, no, hang on. Moshe's response is interesting and puts us in mind of something which Paul says. Moshe says, would that all Yehovah's people were prophets. And the word there is Nebi, and it's from this word to speak as the Spirit gives utterance. So he's saying, I would that all the Lord's people would speak as the Spirit gives utterance. And in 1 Corinthians 14, we read, I would that you all spoke with tongues. I would that you all spoke as the Spirit gave you utterance, but rather that you prophesied. For greater is he that prophesies than he that speaks with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. And of course, prophesying is also speaking as the Spirit gives utterance. So what's going on? In the Greek, we've got two expressions. We've got tongues and we've got prophesying. Now think heart and mind. When we read, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Okay, just think about heart and mind. What well, as in the Hebrew, we've just got heart. We've just got one word to cover the two things. In the Hebrew, we have one word, nabah, to speak as the Spirit gives utterance, not tongues and prophesying. They're not separated out. This word describes both speaking in tongues and prophesying. Think heart. In Deuteronomy 6, we see rather than the Greek thoughts where the heart and the mind are separated, here we've just got the heart encompassing the heart and the mind in the Hebrew. So Joshua speaks the first time and he gets it wrong. Joshua speaks the second time and probably wished that he hadn't. But it's a good thing to keep company with the righteous though, isn't it? We read, Do not let my heart incline to any evil, to busy myself with wicked deeds in company with men who work iniquity, and let me not eat of their delicacies. Let me not hang around them. Let me not get ingratiated into them and all that caper. Rather, let a righteous man strike me. It is a kindness. Let him rebuke me, it is oil for my head, let my head not refuse it. And we see each time that Joshua gets things wrong, he is put in his place. Next we see Joshua in a more favorable light. 
And again, he is keeping good company. And we look at the sin of the spies. Twelve spies are sent to the promised land. They return and all except Joshua and Caleb give a bad report. Numbers 13 says, Jehovah spoke to Moshe saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, everyone a chief from among them. And we've got from the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. And as we read earlier, from the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea, the son of Nun. These were the names of the men who Moshe sent out to spy the land, and Moshe called Hoshea, the son of Nun, Joshua. So Moshe added the letter Yod to Hoshua's name, changing his name from Hoshua, which means salvation, deliverance to Yahushua, Yah shall save, deliver, and redeem. And Moshe sent them to spy the land of Canaan and said to them, Get you up to this way southward and go up into the mountain and see, and the word is Ra'ah there, the land, what it is, and the people that dwell therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many. And what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds. And what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood, whether there be trees, I think he's what he's saying, therein or not. And be you of good courage and bring of the fruit of the land. Now, the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. So, the spies did go trekking through the land. However, they failed to see, to ra'ah the land and bring back a vision to the people. Now, note the concept of seeing in Deuteronomy and notice the grace of Jehovah in his response to Moshe. He said, I pray, let me cross over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, those pleasant mountains and Lebanon. And Jehovah did not allow Moshe to cross over, but he did give him eyes to see. It's the same word used here. Go up to the top of Pisgah, lift your eyes toward the west, the north, the south, and the east, and see Ra'ar with your eyes, for you shall not cross over this Jordan. And it's pretty impossible to believe that he could have seen all these things unless the Lord gave him the ability to see to Ra'ar. Now the spies, they just didn't see, they did not Ra'ar when they went to spy out the land. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob, as men came to Hamath. And they, they ascended by the south, and they came unto Hebron, where Ahiman, Shishai, and Talmai, the children of Anach, were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And they came unto the brook of Eshkol, and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bare it between two upon a staff, and they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. And the place was called the Brook of a Skull because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from thence. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. Okay, and they went and they came to Moshe and to Aharon and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word to them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. They told him and they said, We come to the land where the ascent is and surely it flows with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. So the land's actually pretty amazing. Look at this amazing fruit. It's flowing with milk and honey. All the things that we could possibly want. Nevertheless, this is where the lack of faith comes in. The people be strong that dwell in the land and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there, which have this reputation of being like really huge people. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. Okay, they're scared of these people, and yet actually we read in Amos 2.9, it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and who was as strong as the oaks. The Lord was going to do it anyway, if only they'd have just had faith in him. Now, this is the one that Joshua is going to keep company with. Caleb still the people before Moshe and said, let us go up at once and possess it for we were well able to overcome it. He's not even, let's just have a think about it. He's like, let's go now. Let's do it. I really like Caleb. As we have noted, Joshua has a habit of keeping good company. He has aligned himself with the only other spy who has faith in Yehovah. Again, he that walks with wise men should be wise. But a companion of fools shall be destroyed. I ask you to let it sink in. But the men that went up with him said, we, are, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And the Hebrew word for than we is the same as the Hebrew word for than him. So with that change, 
The men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than him. They do not have faith in Jehovah. They do not trust him. They lack faith in him and his promises. In Exodus 23, the Lord's already said to them, I will send my terror before you and will throw into confusion all the people against whom you shall come. And I will make of all your enemies turn their backs to you. And I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites from before you. Now at first the spies said the land was good, but following Caleb's outburst, they changed their tune. Verse 32, and they brought up an evil report of the land. Oh, okay. So this land that's beautiful, flowing with milk and honey and all this. And said, uh, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land though which we have gone to search it is as a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. In other words, look, really sorry, but we don't think the Lord is capable. We're scared. These people are big. We don't really trust him. And this is really all to do with having faith in Jehovah and in his promises and in his word. And we read in chapter 14, all the congregation lifted up the... I love that picture. <laughs> all the congregation lifted up, up their voice and cried and the people wept that night. So this is like, they're supposed to be at a moment of real, like, yeah, come on, let's go and do it. Like Caleb was and what are they doing? Crying and weeping. Now today in Joshua 5 to 8, we will be reading about the generation that did make it, okay? But this that we're reading about now is the generation that didn't. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moshe and Aharon. The whole congregation said to them, would that we had died in the land of Egypt or that we had died in this wilderness? Why is Jehovah bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? Okay, so they're actually saying that their offspring are just going to, they're going to get killed. Okay. Then came the final insult to Jehovah and the land that he was preparing for his people. They said to one another, let us make a captain and let us return to Egypt. Let's go back to the world. Forget Moshe, forget who represents the word of God, obviously. Forget all that. Let's go back to the world. Let us make a captain return to Egypt. Let us no longer be led by Moshe the Torah. Let's go back to the world. A time of testing. Oh, oh, it's a bit scary. Oh, something difficult. Oh, I don't like this. The result, many turn from holy following the word. They might not cry out, let's go back to the world. But that's what's in their hearts. We actually see people do this, don't we? Something's a little bit challenging, a little bit like, oh, it says I've got to do this. Oh, no. Oh, I don't know. I don't trust. No. I know the Lord promises it will all be good and he's with me and everything, but no. I'll tell you what, I'm not going to do that. Forget Moses. Forget the Torah. Forget the word. I'm going to go back and do this. But the desire of the righteous ends only in good. The righteous, the one who actually walks in accordance with the word. The expectation uh, the, and the expectation of the wicked in wrath. So whatever they think they're going to expect, they're going to get, and it's all going to be great and all this. No, I'm very sorry, but what is coming is wrath. Then Moshe and Aharon fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. This was a way of demonstrating grief and like real of strong emotion. So this was um, their way of saying to everyone, what are you doing? Okay, and they spoke unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, the land which we have passed through to search it is an exceeding good land, which they know. These other spies knew this. They'd seen all the huge fruit, and it was full of milk and honey. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Clearly, Joshua is passionate about the promises of Jehovah, and he trusts in Jehovah. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones, and the glory of Jehovah appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And this is actually how many react if their lack of faith is challenged, or if their disobedience is challenged. Because they're one and they're both the same thing, aren't they? Oh, they don't like this, and they'll turn nasty. 
William Bullock Sr. I'll include this because I, I like what he says. It is not great theological deception that ever derails us. It is the coldness of our own hearts. It's not a false prophecy or a false prophet that leads us astray. It is our own bent towards fleshly distraction. It's not the lies or even all that all out assaults of Satan that will defeat us. It's our relentless love affair with our own beliefs and opinions. So what he's getting at is the fact that it's what's in people's hearts that causes them to go after the wrong things. The generation of the Exodus allowed their fleshly appetites, attitudes, and opinions to cause them to reject the promised land and cry out, Oh, that we had died in Egypt and stayed in the world. Many may have physically been related to Yaakov, but they were most definitely not true spiritual sons of Israel. Because as we've seen, to be that, you have to be one who hearkens to Jehovah to be part of his holy nation. These people, they didn't want to be holy. They hankered after the world. And they lacked faith. So ask yourself, how are you when you're faced with challenges? Do you trust Yehovah? Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. Okay. The righteous. Okay. Difficult things may come but they're solid. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast. Why? Because they trust in Yehovah. Now we are called to be just like Joshua and Caleb and stand firm, even if everybody else around us says, you big fool, you idiots, and picks up stones to throw us and chucks at us and just doesn't want to know and wants to have a go at us. We're to be just like them, to be standing firm because we're to trust in Yehovah. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men. Or in your translation, it might say, be courageous, be strong. Surely the righteous will never be shaken because their hearts are steadfast, trusting in Jehovah. Is that you? Moshe intercedes on behalf of the people. He says, Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of thy mercy. And as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. So these people who've been crying and weeping, let's go back to Egypt. Moshe prays for them. Jehovah gives his answer. Jehovah said, I have pardoned according to your word. Which sounds good, doesn't it? It's like, whew, great. But Jehovah continues. But truly as I live and as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of Yehovah. I love that. As truly as that's going to happen. Because that's just a certainty. None of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness. And yet have put me to the test these ten times. And have not shimmered my voice. Shall see the land that I swore to give to their fathers. And none of those who despise me shall see it. They expressed their intense desire to die in the desert rather than to enter the land of Israel. So let it be done, so let it be written, and Yehovah give them the desires of their heart. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit, and because he has done what? He has followed me fully, wholly with all of his heart. I will bring into the land into which he went, and his descendants shall possess it. Now, we'll just say... For the short, Caleb is pretty amazing. <laughs> we shall see more of him when we look at Joshua 14. You'll get a bit of a better picture. Caleb was amazing because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. Now, for those who do not shema, it's such a different story. The half hearted will not inherit, inherit the promises of Jehovah. Now, since the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valleys, the Lord says to these people, who've just rejected this, the land that he said, he, I'll go in for you. The Lord says, turn back because these uh, turn tomorrow and set out for the wilderness by way to the Red Sea. And they're like, oh, okay. And the Yehovah spoke to Moshe and to Aaron saying, how long shall this wicked congregation grumble against me? I've heard the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumble against me. Say to them, as I live, declares Yehovah, what you have said in my hearing, I will do to you. Now this should make us all pretty like worried about the thought of grumbling against Yehovah when things seem a little bit difficult in our lives. 
The dead bodies, he says to these people, shall fall in the wilderness, in this wilderness, and of all your number listed in the census from 20 years old and upward, who have grumbled against me. Not one shall come into the land where I swore that I would make you dwell, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. So why? Because they have wholly followed Yehovah. Now, this is the verse that leads us to today's events. Okay, But your little ones, who you said would become a prey, I will bring in, and they shall know the land that you have rejected. But as for you, your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness, and your children shall be shepherds in the wilderness forty years. You will suffer for your faithfulness, faithlessness until the last of your dead bodies lies in the wilderness. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, forty days, a year for each day, you shall bear your iniquity forty years, and you shall know my displeasure. I, Jehovah, have spoken. Surely I will do this to all this wicked congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall come to a full end, and there they shall die. Now the men who Moshe sent out to spy the land, who returned and made all the congregation grumble against him by bringing up a bad report about the land. The men who brought up a bad report of the land died by plague before Jehovah. Of those men who went to spy out the land, only Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, remained alive. And Moshe told these sayings unto all the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. Okay. And they rose early in the morning, and they went up to the heights of the hill country, saying, Here we are, we'll go up to the place that Jehovah has promised, for we have sinned. But Moshe said, Why now are you transgressing the command of Jehovah? And that will not succeed. And we'll see throughout this teaching that if Yehovah is with you, that's brilliant. If he is not with you, uh-oh. So these people are saying, let's just disobey Yehovah again. It's bound to turn out well if we say sorry and we just ignore what he said. So we'll go up to the place that Yehovah has promised for we have sinned. Sounds quite like, you know, oh, that sounds quite righteous, doesn't it? Oh, we have sinned, confession and all this. But these people are confessing their sin whilst preparing to sin. Because what he's actually told them to do is to turn and to go into the wilderness. So they're defying him. Do not go up, for Jehovah is not among you, lest you be struck down before your enemies. For there the Amalekites and the Canaanites are facing you, and you shall fall by the sword, because you have turned back from following Jehovah. Jehovah will not be with you. And I find it, as I've gone through this teaching, it just makes me realize... It doesn't matter what situations look like in your life. It really doesn't matter. What really matters is if Yehovah is with you or if he is not with you. Now, only two people put their trust in Yehovah. Well, those two people would to enter into the promises of Yehovah. And them two people would know victory. And I just think, wow. Lord, I always pray the same prayer, don't I? Lord, let me not go far from you. I don't want to go far away. I always want to be trusting in him and knowing that he is with me. But these people, they presume to go up to the heights of the hill country, although neither the Ark of the Covenant of Jehovah nor Moshe departed out of the camp. So what happened to those who presume to defy Jehovah and cast his word behind them? The Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived in that hill country came down and defeated them and pursued them even to Huma. So they got boomf, defeated because Jehovah was not with them. Now I include that account as it helps us to see who were those who forfeited the chance to enter into the promises of Jehovah. We read in Psalm 106, Then they despised the pleasant land having no faith in his promise. They murmured in their tents and did not shema the voice of Jehovah. Don't be like one of these people. No faith in the promises of Jehovah, refusing to shema his voice. We see that Joshua wholly followed Jehovah in all things. And he had faith and he kept good company. And today we see Joshua lead those of the second generation. 
Those that the first generation said were doomed to die. And it is these that shall know the land and they will have victory. Because they will hearken to Jehovah's voice. And we'll see that as we go through. Now Moshe recalls the rebellion in Deuteronomy and he says this, Jehovah heard your words and was angered. And he swore, not one of these evil men of this evil generation shall see the good land that I swore to give to your fathers. Except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he shall see it. And to him and to his children I will give the land on which he has trodden because he has wholly followed Jehovah. So I would ask you all to ask yourselves, could this be this, the way you were described? Are you somebody who wholly follows Jehovah? Moshe goes on and says, Even with me, Jehovah was angry on your account, and he said, You shall not go in there. And here we have Joshua called to be leader. Joshua, the son of Nun, who stands before you, he shall enter. Encourage him. Please note, we're going to see this all the way through. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. And as for your little ones, who you said would become a prey, and your children, who today have no knowledge of good or evil, they shall go in there, and to them I will give it, and they shall possess it. So, <clears throat> once we have Joshua established as the one who will lead Israel into the promised land, we're going to see many instances of encouragement being offered. I commanded Joshua at that time, your eyes have seen all that Jehovah your God has done to these two kings. So Jehovah will do to all the kingdoms into which you are crossing. You shall not fear them, for it is Jehovah your God who fights for you. Okay, he's saying, remember what we did to Sion and Og and all these things. Okay. And he's saying the Lord is going to be with you. He's going to fight for you. And we'll see this over and over again. Elvah speaks to Moshe and says this, For you shall not go over this Jordan, but charge Joshua, encourage and strengthen him. For he shall go over at the head of this people, and he shall put them in possession of the land that you shall see. So all this, encourage him, encourage him, encourage him. Just put yourself in Joshua's position. I think um, like he is to take over from Moshe. Can you imagine how daunting that must have been when you consider who Moshe was and the things that he's seen that have happened? And it's like, now you're going to lead the people. <laughs> like, okay. He's to lead the nation into battle. And it's not even like you're just going to lead the nation and you're just going to have a quiet time of it and you can just sit in your tent and like hope everybody doesn't notice. No. He's going to lead the nation into battle to take the land. He was one of the spies. He knows what he's up against. He knows about all these strongholds and all this. He does trust in Jehovah, obviously. But can you imagine it? We sometimes read about these people. We forget that they were people. He's in this position where a lot is being asked of him. The people of Israel were tested. They were seen to lack faith. Joshua stood firm. He wholly followed Yehovah. The people will die in the wilderness. Joshua will enter into the promises of Yehovah. Okay. And this is the position that he's in. And this is amazing. He's excited about it. But he faces a real challenge, doesn't he? Wait for Yehovah and keep his way and he will exalt you to inherit the land you will look on when the wicked are cut off. And we've seen that the word for wait in Yehovah is to hope in him, to trust in him. All Joshua's life would seem to be an apprenticeship for what Yehovah has planned for him now that he has proven himself steadfast. Yehovah knows how tough a job Joshua has ahead of him. Yehovah knows how insecure he might feel and so he encourages him time and time again. And sometimes we may face things that seem intimidating or too challenging in our own personal lives. Please note, Yehovah knows how we feel. And I bet most have experienced being encouraged by Yehovah in your own life, in your own walk, when things have been difficult. And Yehovah has come and he's just done something that's made you go, oh Lord, thank you. 
And it's his way of saying, I'm with you. We, just like Joshua, are also charged to be strong and courageous. To trust in him, to have faith in him. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, be courageous. Only be strong and courageous, being careful to do according to the law that Moshe, my servant, commanded you. Don't turn to the right or to the left that you might have good success wherever you go. Being strong and courageous is equated with not being deterred from walking in all of Jehovah's ways and trusting in him no matter what. Wait on Jehovah as we've seen in teachings previous. Hope in him, trust in him. Be of good courage, Hazak, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on Jehovah. And there's that word, Hazak, in Greek is Andrezu. Act like a man, it's the same thing. Be of good courage, act like a man. Be watchful, stand firm, act like a man, be of good courage. That is, hope in Jehovah, be stout-hearted and decided in your convictions, no matter what, even if they pick up stones and they want to chuck them at you. Even if there's big giants, whatever it is, just stand firm. And he shall strengthen. And the verb is a mets, and it is in the hippal form, meaning that once you're assured of your convictions, then Yehovah produces the courage in you. Just like Joshua, we are given the same call. Be strong and courageous, sure of your convictions, be steadfast. And just like Joshua, the Lord comes along and he says to us, I am with you. And he encourages us in our own personal walks. Moshe continues with encouraging words later in Deuteronomy. Moshe continued to speak all these words to Israel and he said to them, I'm 120 years old today, I'm no longer able to go out and come in. Jehovah has said to me, you shall not go over this Jordan. Jehovah, your God himself will go over before you, will destroy these nations before you so that you shall dispossess them. And Joshua will go over at your head as Jehovah has spoken. And Jehovah will do to them as he did to Sion and Og, the king of the Amorites, and to their land when he destroyed them. And Jehovah will give them over to you and you shall do to them according to the whole commandment that I have commanded you. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is Jehovah your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. How amazing. And Moshe summoned Joshua and he said to him, Size of all Israel, be strong and courageous, for you shall go with this people into the land that Jehovah has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall put them in possession of it. It is Jehovah who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. The people of Israel certainly needed encouragement and so did Joshua. But the call is always be strong and courageous. Jehovah is with you. Joshua is commissioned to lead Israel. Jehovah said to Moshe, Behold, the day approaches when you must die. Call Joshua and present yourselves in the tent of meeting that I may commission him. And Moshe and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tent of meeting. And Jehovah appeared in the tent in a pillar of cloud, and the pillar of cloud stood over the entrance of the tent. And Jehovah commissioned Joshua the son of Nun and said, Be strong and courageous, for you shall bring the people of Israel into the land that I swore to give them. I will be with you. Something that is over, often overlooked. The song of Moshe. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak, and let the earth hear the words of my mouth. May my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, like gentle rain upon the tender grass, and like showers upon the herb. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. So what does Moshe have to say about the name of Jehovah? The rock, his work is perfect. All his ways are just, Mishpat, a God of faithfulness, that's that word, Emunah. And without iniquity, he is just, Zadik, righteous and upright, Yashar is he. And the song ends, Or well, make my arrows drunk with blood, and my sword shall devour flesh with the blood of the slain and the captives from the beginning of revenges upon the enemy. 
Rejoice with him, O heavens, bow down to him, all gods, for he avenges the blood of his children and takes vengeance on his adversaries. He repays those who hate him and cleanses his people's land. So this is a look that Yehovah will make atonement for his people and for the land. And this points us to the end and to Yeshua's return. Then we have verse 44. Moshe came and recited all the words of this song in the hearing of the people. He and Joshua, the son of Nun. So it wasn't just Moshe, it was Joshua with him reciting this song. Joshua recited it along with Moshe. The song that talks all about who Yehovah is, his character, and all the promises that Yehovah gives to his people. It brings us to the last reference to Joshua before the book of Joshua. Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom for Moshe had laid his hand on him. So the people of Israel obeyed him and did as Yehovah had commanded Moshe. And he will turn out to be an amazing leader. We'll read in Joshua 24. Israel served Yehovah all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua and had known all the work that Yehovah did for Israel. And from last week, the waters of the Jordan pile up in a heap and the people cross on dry land. Joshua 3, and Joshua said to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. And later it says, and the priest bearing the Ark of the Covenant of Yehovah stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all Israel was passing over on dry ground until all the nation passing over the Jordan. When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, Yehovah said to Joshua, take 12 men from the people from each tribe. Command them, saying, take twelve stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. This was as a memorial. And when all the people had finished passing over the ark of Jehovah, and the priests passed over before the people. And as soon as all the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to the west, and all the kings of the Amorites who were by the sea, heard that Yehovah had dried up the waters of the Jordan for the people of Israel until they had crossed over. Their hearts melted and there was no longer any spirit of, in them because of the people of Israel. And that's how our Parsha begins. But the peoples are terrified. Word is spread about who these people are. At that time, Yehovah said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the sons of Israel a second time. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel at Gebeath ha Haraloth because they hadn't been circumcised. This is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the males of the people who came out of Egypt, all the men of war, died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. So all the people who came out had been circumcised, yet all the people who were born on the way in the wilderness after they had come out of Egypt had not been circumcised. But the people of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness until all the nation, the men of war who came out of Egypt, perished because they did not obey the voice of Jehovah. And Jehovah swore to them that they would not see the land that Jehovah had sworn to their fathers to give to us, a land flowing with milk and honey. Please note they didn't circumcise their children. This, this was the disobedient generation, wasn't it? So it was their children whom he raised up in their place that Joshua circumcised, but they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. When the circumcising of the whole nation was finished, <laughs> me and JP used to laugh about that whole, like, all these people being circumcised at once. We used to imagine this big pile of foreskins, and we used to call it Foreskin Mountain. <laughs> We're going to Foreskin Mountain. <laughs> it's just, what a picture, though, of all these people. When the circumcising of the whole nation was finished, they remained in their places in the camp, until they were healed. As you can see, we used to be very immature. <laughs> we're much more mature. <laughs> and Yehovah said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. And so the name of that place is called Gilgal to this day. <laughs> oh, foreskin man. <laughs> Sorry, I'll have to stop. The people are to go in to take the land, but first circumcision, a show of obedience before they would go in and do it. The previous generation, as I mentioned before, had failed to circumcise their children. Then is another show of obedience, and the people do in Passover. And while the people of Israel were encamped at Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month in the evening on the plains of Jericho. The day after the Passover, on the very day, they ate of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. 
The manna ceased the day after they ate of the produce of the land, and there was no longer manna for the people of Israel. They ate of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Okay, and we'll come to a close as we just look at this last bit of Joshua chapter 5. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of Jehovah. Now I have come. Joshua fell with his face on the earth and he worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? He bows in humility. How about you? Is this your response to Jehovah? Commander of Jehovah's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Which is an obvious parallel, isn't it, to Moshe at the burning bush. So here, Jehovah meets with Joshua just before he goes to take the land. Just as he met with Moshe just before, he went to challenge Pharaoh and call Israel out of Egypt. The two promises there, the people and the land. So Joshua has been encouraged. The Lord has even come before him and said, now I'm here. And what's always said to him, be strong and courageous. Be sure of your convictions. Be steadfast. I am with you. And as I say, I bet most have experienced being encouraged by Jehovah in little ways in your life. Maybe you were feeling down. And his letting you know, I am with you. I've had it in my life many times. You are my God and I will give. I will give thanks to you. You are my God and I will extol you. I'll give thanks to Jehovah for he is good and his steadfast love endures forever. It was interesting. Uh, yesterday, I got a text off Jeff. Um, and he said <clears throat> he was feeling, he'd been feeling down. Now, when he was here, he had been feeling down. And I met him and we played squash. He probably felt even more down after that because I beat him. <laughs> But <laughs> while we were playing, um, I spoke to him, and um, it was something that I said that really like um, hit hit him, which was I just said to him, "You are not alone," and it it meant a lot to him at the time because I think he was feeling really vulnerable and the situation was really vulnerable. And then he texted me yesterday, and he said. He'd been feeling down, and he'd been feeling really lost. And he said, and just as he was feeling all these feelings, and he was feeling down, he said, uh, a truck went past, and on the back of the truck was written, Jesus, and then underneath it, you are not alone. And he was like, wow. And it just lifted him, it just encouraged him. It's just a perfect example of what I'm talking about, where the Lord will come into your life, and he will just, his way of letting you know, I am with you. And he just encourages us when sometimes we might face things that are a little bit challenging. So be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Be courageous. Just be resolved to walk in his ways. To do that which pleases him. Because blessed is the nation whose God is Jehovah, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. Behold, the eye of Jehovah is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love. To fear him is to walk in his ways and to, to keep his commandments. Our soul waits for Jehovah. We hope in him, we trust in him. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. We know who he is and we trust in him. So wait on Jehovah, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Hope in him, trust in him, be stout-hearted, decided in your convictions, and he will strengthen you. And it says in Isaiah 26, and we'll come to a close, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. 
trust in Yehovah forever, for Yehovah, God, is an everlasting rock. And in part two, we will read as Israel goes into battle. We might get the kids up to, to blow the trumpets as well. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. That could be quite um, chaotic. Part two. There we go. <clears throat> we read it earlier. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on you because he trusts in you. Okay, because we're going to be looking at the generation who do trust in Yehovah. Trust in Yehovah forever, for Yehovah is an everlasting rock. So, here we go into Joshua chapter 6 and Jericho. Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. They've got, they've got wind of these people. Um, the Israelites and everybody's hearts have melted. And Yehovah said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus you shall do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. So Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the ark of the covenant, and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of Jehovah. And he said to the people, Go forward, march around the city, and let the armed men pass on before the ark of Jehovah. So, <clears throat> there's our bits of instructions. I just want you to ask, can you imagine the first generation's reaction to these instructions? Something like, you know, <clears throat> there were the people who had no trust in Yehovah, and he's talking about marching around and blowing trumpets and stuff. I can imagine it be a bit like, oh, it's the worst day of my life. Have you heard what Joshua the same was supposed to do? Trumpets and shouting, it's a disaster. Can you imagine it? <clears throat> but people are like this in their own lives, aren't they? Oh, have you heard? I'm supposed to keep the Sabbath. And they're saying everything will be okay. Have you seen my boss? I lose everything. It's not like I've even got a choice. Oh, I'm supposed to wear these tassels. And oh, everyone's going to take me seriously with these on. Joking, aren't you? Oh, I'm supposed to get circumcised at my age. Oh, it's the worst day of my life. But the people of the second generation, they have trust. And they will go in and enter into the promises of Yehovah. Everything is cyclical. What has been is what will be and what has been done is what will be done. And there's nothing new under the sun. There will always be these people who lack faith. But there will always be those people who will trust in Yehovah. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. And the word there is apistia, related to pistis, leading you to fall away from the living God. As we see an unbelieving heart, that's a heart that's bent towards disobedience. We actually see later in this, those who were disobedient, unable to enter because of their unbelief, the connection between the two being made clear. So, take care brothers, this is a serious warning. A warning that sadly not everybody heeds as is evidenced by the fact that so many fall away. They're tested in a matter, something a bit scary. They lack faith and they disobey. They have an unbelieving heart. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, a heart that is bent towards being disobedient. 1 Timothy 4 says, The Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Pistis, this word again, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We're told to take care. 
But we're also told in the last days, lots of people will depart from the faith. They will go after false teaching, depart from the faith, this word pistis or belief. So in the latter times, they'll depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. And it's this word in the Greek, planos. Okay, seducing, deceiver. Wandering, roving, misleading, leading into error, corrupted, deceiver. And in Job 19.4, we see the word talked about delusion. And again, <clears throat> some shall be given to delusions. We see the word in Jeremiah 23.32, giving heed to delusions. So many people led astray, they give themselves over to delusions. These people with unbelieving hearts, people who are bent on disobedience. So take care, brothers, the warning is there, lest any of you have an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened, not where this sclerenu or chazak, through the deceitfulness of sin. And we can see here that an unbelieving heart, heart is a hard heart. Okay? And we know an unbelieving heart is a disobedient heart. And we also read here, and this warning, take care, brothers, exhort one another daily. And I'll come back to Psalm 141. Do not let my heart incline to any evil, to busy myself with wicked deeds in company with men who work iniquity, and let me not eat of their delicacies. Exhort one another. Let a righteous man strike me, it is a kindness. Let him rebuke me, it is oil for my head. Let my head not refuse it. Okay. Exhort one another. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings him back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Exhort one another. A reproof enters more into a wise man than a hundred stripes into a fool. Again, keep good company. Exhort one another. Be wise if somebody reproves you. But Proverbs 17 actually continues and says, An evil man seeks rebellion indeed, therefore an unmerciful messenger shall be sent to him. I instantly think of the second generation who were rebellious. Uh, the first generation rather who were rebellious. And an unmerciful messenger shall be sent against them. What did they get to hear? Your body shall fall in the wilderness. Again, we come back to this. He that walks with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Take care, brothers, lest there be an evil and unbelieving heart, and you're giving away to delusion, giving away to being led astray. Let us consider how to stir one another up to love and to good works, and not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you say the day, see the day drawing near. And again, we come back to this idea of encouragement. So just think of Joshua. He didn't go along with the fools. He walked with the wise. He was encouraged, even when he got things wrong. The message to him was, you shall enter, as opposed to those who were bent on rebellion. The unmerciful messenger who says, your bodies will dry in the wilderness. We go back to Hebrews 3, and it says, we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. So there's your once saved, always saved, in trouble. As it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. It's talking about the rebellion in the wilderness. The deceitfulness of sin can strengthen our hearts to be hardened so that we behave just as those in the wilderness did. We don't want a hard heart. A hard heart is an unbelieving heart. Blessed is the one who fears the Lord always, but whoever hardens his heart will fall into calamity. Those with hard hearts do not fear Yehovah. They do not love him because the connection between fearing him, keeping his commandments, and loving him, keeping his commandments, is clear for us all to see. Blessed is the one who fears Yehovah always, the one who loves Yehovah always in all things, the one who walks in his ways. But whoever hardens his heart, no, not good. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. And all these things were written for our instruction. We've seen what happened to the first generation. We've seen what they were like. And the rebellion is described in Nehemiah by those who were repentant for the sins of their fathers. And they said, They and our fathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their neck and did not obey your commandments. 
stiff in their neck. There is no humility in them whatsoever. They refused to obey. They would not shema and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them. Okay, so that meant nothing to them. They stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to the slavery in Egypt. Okay, do not let the deceitfulness of sin strengthen your heart so that you behave as these people did. These people did what? They stiffened their neck. They refused to shema Yehovah. No humility whatsoever. And we know it is the, it's the one I look to. He was humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. These people not interested. They were rebellious. That's what it tells. And the Hebrew there is marah. We've looked at this before. And the fact that it means to be bitter. As opposed to sweet. As opposed to those who walk in the sweetness of the word. How sweet are your words to my taste? Sweeter than honey to my mouth. And it says that they were stiff-necked. That is, they were disobedient. And they hankered after the things of the world. As we see, they stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. And the word to the second generation in Deuteronomy 10 and Deuteronomy 11, in light of all that they've seen with this first generation, we'll read now. Now Israel, what does Jehovah your God require of you but to fear Jehovah your God, which we've seen is to love him and walk in his ways. Walk in his ways, love him, serve Jehovah your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And to keep the commandments and statutes of Jehovah which I am commanding you today for your good. Behold, to Jehovah your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth with all that is in it. Yet Jehovah set his heart in love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them you above all peoples as you are this day circumcise this therefore the foreskin and its ola of your heart and be no longer stubborn or stiff-necked and we've just seen what it is to be stubborn and stiff-necked now please bear in mind that foreskin ola means blockage remove that from your heart that of the flesh which causes a blockage that which causes you not to fully surrender to Jehovah. You're to love him with all your heart and all your soul. For Jehovah your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who is not partial and takes no bribe. Or as Peter puts it, truly I understand that God shows no partiality. Jehovah won't be bribed. He certainly doesn't respond to great religious demonstrations. We've seen what he's interested in and that is what is in your heart. We read in Psalm 81, those hating Jehovah feign obedience to him. They make a show of it and a pretense of it, but he's not interested in that. He sees the secret things. He sees the thoughts and intentions of the heart. He is looking for a people that will love him with all their hearts. Be no longer stiff-necked, stubborn. The message to the second generation this message the second generation were given is the same message we read in Hebrews. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Okay. We've seen what the first generation were like. We're not to be like them. If we want to be the people who entered into the promises of Jehovah. Don't be led away. Be resolute and stand firm. Wait on Yehovah, be of good courage, he will strengthen your heart. I say wait on Yehovah. Hope in him. Be stout-hearted and decided in your convictions. There's so many people who make a show of and they do feign obedience. But then the challenge comes in their life and it's a little bit tough and they'll just wander off a little bit just to make life a bit easier for themselves. But they're all the characteristics of the first generation. They're the people that should heed the warning. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an unbelieving, disobedient heart. We're to be stout-hearted and sure of our convictions. That means that no matter what, we do not waver. We do not sway. We are steady and firm in Yehovah. And he will strengthen us. Be watchful. Stand firm in faith. Act like men. Be courageous and be strong. 
And when challenges come in your life, see it as an opportunity to be strong and courageous. Be of good courage. How do we become Hazak? In Deuteronomy 11, it says, You shall therefore keep the whole commandment that I command you today, that you may be Hazak. And the Lord keeps calling us to be Hazak of good courage. Go in, take possession of the land that you are going over to possess. And those people that do this are the people who will enter into the promises of Jehovah. When we keep the whole commandment, we are strong, Hazak. When we are Hazak of good courage, Jehovah strengthens us. What became of those in the wilderness with hard hearts? For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moshe? So many people who are going to claim to have walked in the Torah and followed the Torah are not going to make it because they're not steadfast. They lack faith. They lack trust in Jehovah and they have unbelieving hard hearts and stiff necks. And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned whose bodies fell in the wilderness? To whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? There, flat out, straightforward. We see they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Of course, unbelief and disobedience, hand in hand. And an unbelieving heart is a hard heart. It's the very thing we're warned against. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, be no longer stiff-necked and stubborn. These are the warnings to us, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now the thing we see with the second generation is that they have belief. They are obedient, even when what they are asked to do might seem to make little sense. There is no grumbling or questioning. What? He wants me to walk around with a trumpet. They just obey. If we want to enter into the promises of Jehovah, then we need to be like them. But as we see them described in these scriptures. But sadly, so many people are just like those who perished. They're hard-hearted, they are bitter, and they are disappointment. Disobedient. The first generation, hanging after the things of the world in Egypt. Keen to run back to the bondage that Jehovah freed them from when the challenges come along. But do not love the world or the things in the world. You've been free, you've been taken out of the world, haven't you? If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world and the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father but is from the world. The world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. I delight to do your will, O oh my God, your Torah is within my heart. And yet so many people, when a challenge is met and they come in their lives, they want to run back to the world. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And this is a stark warning between the two, okay? The Lord preserves all those who love him, which is those who fear him, those who are not stiff-necked, those who actually humble themselves before him. But all the wicked he will destroy. Jehovah knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. All those people who want to go running back to the world, those people who are not steadfast. The righteous are those who love him, and Jehovah preserves them. The righteous are those who shema. And whoever does the will of God abides forever will enter into the promises of Jehovah, but the wicked will perish. When things are challenging, the message is the same to us as it was to Joshua and the people of the second generation. Be strong and courageous. Be sure of your convictions. Be steadfast. The Lord's message is, I am with you. You are not alone. The second generation is steadfast. We read in James 1, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. But when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has appointed to those who love him. I remember saying to somebody once who'd done something, and I said, that was not very loyal of you, was it? And they said, well, 
I'm usually loyal. It was just that in this instance, I was like, do you mean when your loyalty was tested, <laughs> then you weren't loyal? It's like, wow. All these people, you can declare your great love for the Lord and all this, but what happens when you come to a place of testing? What happens then? Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has appointed to those who love him. Hebrews 10. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which is a great reward. You have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Talk about being steadfast again. And of course, <clears throat> I delight to do your will. Oh my God, your law is within my heart. When you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. You may enter into the promises of Jehovah. Joshua 6, 8. And just as Joshua had commanded the people, the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before Jehovah went forward, blowing the trumpets with the ark of the covenant of Jehovah, following them. The armed men were walking before the priests who were blowing the trumpets and the rear guard was walking after the ark while the trumpets blew continually. Please note, just as they were commanded, that is how they are behaving. Just as they were commanded. It took guts and courage, Hazak, to go in and take the land. Again, I ask you to put yourself actually really into the situation as real people. This is what we're going to do. Yes, Granted, big fortified cities, big huge people. How are we going to go in? We're going to go in blowing trumpets. Okay. Right. Okay. That sounds like a bit scary. <laughs> Real people, though, who were steadfast and who trusted in Jehovah. It was guts that was demonstrated in obedience just as Jehovah had commanded. An obedience that declares, no matter what, I trust Jehovah. This is what it takes to go in and enter into the promises of Jehovah. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. And Joshua commanded the people, you shall not shout. Right, do you want it? somebody to go and get all the rest of the children? This is an important bit, this, by the way. Joshua commanded the people, you shall not shout or make your voice heard. In other words, be quiet. Neither shall any word go out of your mouth until the day I tell you to shout. Then you shall shout. Be quiet, but when I say shout, then you shout. Okay, we're going to see, for people at home, we're going to see if the children here can <laughs> do just this. Can they be quiet until they're told to shout, and then they shout. Do you want to all come over here? So amidst all the excitement, the adrenaline, <clears throat> and all this that's going on, I want you to come over here. Come on, don't be shy. You're not to speak, okay? In fact, you'll have to move out of the way for just for now so that I can read what I've written. <laughs> when I tell you, you can shout, okay? Or blow your shofars. But, oh, not yet. You've got to be quiet till I say shout. What we see with the people of the second generation is obedience. So just wait for it. He caused the ark of Jehovah to circle the city, going about it once, and they came into the camp and spent the night in the camp. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priest took up the ark of Jehovah. And the seven priests met in the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of Jehovah walked on. And they blew the trumpets continually, and the armed men were walking before them. And the rear guard was walking after the ark of Jehovah while the trumpets blew continually. On the second day, they marched around the city once and returned into the camp. So they did for six days. So these people were obedient, right? Now, every time I say, shout, I want you to shout. And then I, I want you to be quiet. Is that okay? Have we got this? Okay. <clears throat> these are the people who trusted in Yehovah. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in Yehovah forever. Yehovah God is an everlasting rock. <laughs> okay. On the, wait for it. On the seventh day they rose early, the dawn of day, and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It's the seventh day. This is the time when they're going to go in. Yeah. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. 
At the seventh time when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout! Yay! For Yehovah has given you the city! Shout! <laughs> for Yehovah has given you the city! Right? Quiet now. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purposes, Shout! For Yehovah has given you the city! <laughs> right for those whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers called to be like our Messiah the one who will lead us into the land victorious shout <laughs> for the Lord has given you the city okay and those whom he predestined he also called and those whom he called he also justified and those whom he justified he also glorified what then shall we say to these things if God is with us who can be against us shout <laughs> there you go thank you for that oh hang on right you can go back to what you were doing now thanks for your help that was really cool well done that was good and noisy shouting, I like that. Thank you. Okay, hope you appreciated that back home. <laughs> back in whatever you were watching it. If you could even hear it, I don't know. <clears throat> okay, now, of course, the sound of the teruah, the trumpet blast or the shout, and Yehovah bringing judgment on his enemies gives us a prophetic picture. Encouraging us to look forward to the day that Yeshua will lead us into promises and into victory. And 1 Thessalonians 4 says this, For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who were left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep, those who have passed on. For the Lord himself would descend from heaven with the, with the cry of command, and with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Again, encourage one another. The sound of the teruah, the trumpet blast, and Yehovah bringing judgment on his enemies will be something terrifying for those who do not walk in righteousness. Isaiah 42 Yehovah will go forth like a warrior. He will arouse his zeal like a man of war. He will utter a shout. Yes, he will raise a war cry and he will prevail against his enemies. Zephaniah 1. The great day of Yehovah is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of Yehovah is bitter and the mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, as I'm sure it was for the people who were in Jericho. A day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. I will bring distress on mankind so that they shall walk like the blind. Why? Because they have sinned against Jehovah. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them on the day of the wrath of Yehovah. In the fire of his jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. For a full and sudden end he will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. Back to Joshua 6. At the seventh time and the priest, had, the priest had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout! <laughs> for Yehovah has given you the city. And the city and all that was within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who were with her in her house shall live because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But you, keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction, lest when you have devoted them you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. But all silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to Jehovah. They shall go into the treasury of Jehovah. So the people shouted and the trumpets were blown and as soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpets the people shouted a great shout and the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city every man straight before him and they captured the city. 
Then they devoted all in the city to destruction, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep and donkeys with the edge of the sword. But to the two men who had spied out the land, Joshua said, Go into the prostitute's house and bring out from there the woman and all who belonged to her as you swore to her. So the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and mother and brothers and all who belonged to it, and they brought all their relatives and put them outside the camp of Israel. And they burned the city with fire and everything in it, only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and of iron they put into the treasury of the house of Jehovah. But Rahab, the prostitute in her father's household, and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved her life. And she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent out to spy out Jericho. This, by the way, is the woman who declared, I know that Jehovah has given you the land. She also said to the two spies as she was hiding them, We have heard how Jehovah dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For Jehovah your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by Jehovah that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also deal kindly with my father's house. The men said to it, Our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when Jehovah gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. And she let the men down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall so that she lived in the wall. She said to them, Go into the hills, or the pursuers will encounter you, and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterward, you may go your way. And as we saw last week, this mention of three days obviously points us to Yeshua. When they were asked, have you got a sign? He said, look to Jonas, Jonah. <clears throat> Man said to her, we will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours that you have made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And you shall gather into your house your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household. So... We have a scarlet cord to identify the house as one to be passed over in the coming judgment. With this mention of three days. Okay, all this obviously points us to the Passover lamb, a house is being passed over from judgment. Mention of three days, Passover lamb, all points us to Yeshua and our deliverance being in him. Then if anyone goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head and we shall be guiltless. But if a hand is laid on anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head. Just as in the Passover, remain indoors. And if you want to see more about what was going on here and you missed last week's teaching, I suggest that you go back and you watch it. JP is unraveling the, the gospel message as we find it written in the book of Joshua. And we'll continue to do that next week, I believe. But if you tell this business of ours, then we should be guiltless with respect to your oath that you've made us swear. And she said, according to the word, so be it. And then she sent them away and departed, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. Did exactly what she was supposed to do. So the scarlet cord, akin to the blood found on the lintels in the Passover, all pointing us to the connection between our deliverance and the blood of the Messiah. And that to be delivered, we must remain in him. How do we remain in him? Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you, i.e. the word of Jehovah, the Torah. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. To abide in Yeshua is to let his word abide in you. 1 John 1, 6-7 And if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Practicing the truth, the word, equals walking in the light. But if we walk in the light... According to the word, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And then the blood of Yeshua, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Then it does. But sadly, there are many who think they are safe. Yet, they will find their houses crashing down when the trumpets sound, and they will wail when Yehovah brings judgment. These are those who do not let the word abide in them. They do not abide in the word. They do not walk in accordance with it. That is, they do not walk in obedience. That is, they are hard 
hearted. They're not steadfast. They are not resolved and resolute to walk in his ways, even when times of testing come. Maybe for a while, maybe in most things, but then, oh, I don't know. When they are tested, though, they are stiff-necked and they do their own thing. But in all of the accounts we've been looking at, what should be impressed upon us in, is the importance of steadfast obedience. If they hadn't have marched around the city seven times and blown the trumpets, do you think they would have gone in and taken the city? If Rahab hadn't have put the scarlet cord out of a window, how do you think it would have gone for her? And please note, it is those who walk in the light, i.e. according to the word, who are cleansed by the blood of Yeshua. Which is obviously, as we've seen, linked to our deliverance. Those in Egypt were safe when they obeyed. The homes were marked by the blood of the Lamb and the judgment of Yehovah passed them by. Rahab was safe. She had faith in Yehovah. She recognized him as God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. She was obedient and hung the scarlet cord. And the judgment of Yehovah passed by her home. In Ezekiel 9, we see that the judgment of Yehovah is visited upon them, calling themselves his people. This is not new, that judgment would come upon those who consider themselves his people, people who actually walk in the Torah as well. There's people here who probably thought that they were safe. But as we see in Ezekiel chapter 8, they were a people that were stiff-necked and hard-hearted. Ezekiel is taken back to the temple. He sees certain things occurred in there. He's brought in through the north gate. He sees not an altar, but an idol. That's in Ezekiel 8, 3. The descriptions of what is going on in and around the temple continue. I went in and I saw and behold every form of creeping thing and abominable beast and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. Verse 11 to 12, we have those people who would look to as representing Yehovah, the elders of the house of Israel involved in all this idolatry. In verse 14, he brought me to the door of the gate of Yehovah's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there were sat women weeping for Tammuz. All this stuff, that is an abomination. And he brought me into the inner court of Yehovah's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of Yehovah, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs towards the temple of Yehovah, and their faces towards the east, and they worshipped the sun towards the east. And in verse 18, Yehovah declares judgment on all these people who would, would say that they were his people. Knocking around the temple, they would call themselves, oh yeah, we, we walk in the Torah of Moshe. But judgment comes. Says, Therefore will I also deal in fury, mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, yet I will not hear them. It sounds a lot like Proverbs 1. You've set it naught all my counsel and with none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear comes. Who does calamity come to? We saw it before. Those who harden their hearts. Bear this with Proverbs 133. Whosoever hearkens, shemars unto me, shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. The declaration of judgment in verse 18 was fulfilled four years after the vision was given in the destruction of Jerusalem. We read about the judgment in chapter 9. Yehovah said to him, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem. Set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. To the others he said in mine hearing, go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the, the ancient men, which were before the house. So here we have a people sealed on their foreheads who are spared from the wrath of Yehovah. The word for mark in Ezekiel 9.4 is tav, tav, um, and vav spelling out the letter tav, as it were, and we know what the letter Tav looks like in the um, Paleo-Hebrew. The letter itself means mark and also means the sign of the covenant. So those sealed are sealed with the sign of the covenant. Who does Yehovah keep covenant with? Oh, the Lord, the great and awesome God, he keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Yeshua says, if you love me, you will cherish my commandments. 
For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Okay, the Lord knows who loves him, who truly, truly love him. So many people might call themselves his people, but they wander off into all kinds of nonsense. They harden their hearts and they stiffen their necks. But the thing that distinguishes Jehovah's people from those that are not his is that they love him. They really love him. They shema his word and they cherish it. Everything about scripture tells us that he's looking for a people that will love him. The covenant we have with him is a betrothal covenant. Think about that. What's that trying to tell us? What he is telling us, what is he telling us of his intentions for us and his expectations of us? And Ezekiel 9 clearly points us to those sealed who will enter into victory with Yeshua, just as the second generation we're reading about now entered in with Joshua. We read in Revelation 14, Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women. They are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in the mouth, no lie was found, for they are blameless. There it is again. <laughs> so how are those who receive Jehovah's mark described in Ezekiel? It says, set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Okay. What is this? Sighing and crying. It's a sign of grief, isn't it? Of strong emotion. They were broken hearted at how Yehovah's name was being profaned by these people who were unbelieving, disobedient people. And it puts me in mind of Joshua and Caleb. Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which of them searched the land that rent their clothes. These two were also upset at what they saw going on amongst these people who were supposedly Yehovah's people. And yet they lacked faith and they cried and they wanted to go to the things of the world. They had no trust in Yehovah, just like those in Ezekiel chapter 8 who put their trust in other gods and all the rubbish that was around them. But these two didn't go along with the crowd, just like those in Ezekiel chapter 9 who have their forehead sealed. They were upset at the people's lack of faith. They trusted in Yehovah. They escaped the judgment that came. Your body shall fall in this wilderness. Just as those people in Ezekiel chapter 9 at the mark on their foreheads escaped the judgment that came when we read in Ezekiel chapter 9. These would enter into victory into the promises of Yehovah. Shout! The Lord has given you the city. Will you enter into victory? Joshua 6 continues. Joshua laid on an oath on them at that time, saying, Curse before Yehovah be the man who rises up and rebuilds this city, Jericho. The cost of his firstborn shall he lay its foundation, and the cost of his youngest son shall he set up its gates. So Yehovah was with Joshua, and his fame was in all the land. Just as Yehovah promised, I am with you. I will fight for you. All the things that Yehovah promised. And everything made from silver, gold, bronze, or iron was brought to the Lord and put in his treasury. However, one man secretly had taken plunder and hidden it. Boom, 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 boom. Part three. Now we're into Joshua 7. The people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah. He took some of the devoted things, and the anger of Yehovah burned against the people of Israel. So who broke faith in regard to the devoted things? The people of Israel. Okay. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth -Avid, east of Bethel, and he said to them, Go up and spy out the land, and the men went up and spied out Ai. 
And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not have all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and attack I. Do not make the whole people toil up there, for they are few. So about three uh, three thousand men went up from the, from the people. And they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and chased them before the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them at the descent. And the hearts of the people melted and became as water. And Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of Jehovah until the, el- uh, the evening. He and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why have you brought, th- uh, brought this people over the Jordan at all? to give us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. Would that we have been content to dwell beyond the Jordan. O Lord, what can I say when Israel has turned their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it, will surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? Elva said to Joshua, get up. He says, why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. Okay. You're laughing because I said get up. You probably didn't say it like that, did you? <laughs> get up. <laughs> Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen or lied and put them uh, among their own belongings. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. So get up, consecrate the people and say, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. For thus says Jehovah, the God of Israel, there are devoted things in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought near by your tribes and the tribe that Jehovah takes by lot shall come near by clans. And the clan that Jehovah takes shall come near by households. And the household that Jehovah takes shall come near man by man. And he who has taken the devoted things shall be burned with fire, he and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of Jehovah, and he has done an outrageous thing in Israel. Imagine if you were him hearing this. So Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel near tribe by tribe, and the tribe of Judah was taken. He brought near the clans of Judah, and the clan of the Zerahites, or the Zerahites, was taken. And he brought near the clan of the Zerahites, man by man, and Zabdi was taken. Can you imagine at this point what Achan is going through and what he's thinking? He brought near his household, man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. So, as I say, can you imagine how he felt now? Those around him felt as they saw this happening. It reminds me of what Paul says in his letter to Timothy. Them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. Okay, so other people will see and go, oh, that's not good, is it? And Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to Jehovah, God of Israel, and give praise to him. And tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua, truly I have sinned against Jehovah, the God of Israel. This is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and then took them. And see, they are hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. So Joshua sent messages and they ran to the tent and behold, it was hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. And they took them out of the tent and brought them to Joshua and to all the people of Israel and they laid them down before Jehovah. Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the cloak and the bar of gold, and his sons and his daughters, and his oxen and his donkeys and his sheep and his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them up to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why do you bring trouble on us? Jehovah brings trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned them with fire and stoned them with stones. Not good, eh? Let's say. Uh, a couple of teachings ago there are always consequences to sin 
They raised over him a great heap of stones. It remains to this day. Then Yehovah turned from his burning anger. Therefore, to this day, the name of that place is called the Valley of Achor. Key points. Yehovah gives the people victory. But there are strict instructions with a serious warning. And what we have is a classic case of someone saying, yeah, it'll be all right. No one will know. It'll be a shame to miss out. I like these things. I want this. A classic case of someone letting their fleshly desires rather than the word of Yehovah dictate their actions. Rather than being led away by fleshly desires, we're to be steadfast. James 1, we read it before. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. And talking about desires. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. And desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. A picture that we see perfectly encapsulated in this story about Achan. So let's just recap some verses. Shout, for Yehovah has given you the city. And the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to Yehovah for destruction. Okay, it's all gone. The word there for destruction, devoted to destruction, is harem. But you keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction, harem or harem. Lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. So they're warned. Don't take any of this stuff, because if you do, this is what will happen. All the silver and gold, though, every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to Jehovah. They shall go into the treasury of Jehovah. In Joshua 7, we read, But the people of Israel broke faith. Okay. And the anger of Jehovah burned against the people of Israel. Who broke faith? The people of Israel. And Jehovah said to Joshua, who's distraught, Get up, why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. Okay, not there's this fella called Achan, and he's done this terrible thing. Achan has sinned. Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them, and they have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. And he's warned the people exactly what will happen. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction, just as I said would happen. I will be with you no more unless you devote, destroy the devoted things from among you. So, the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. Israel has sinned. I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. And this is why the men failed to take I. Because Yehovah was not with them. And in verse 15, And he who is taken with the devoted things, and the word there is cherem, shall be burned with fire he and all that he has because he has transgressed the covenant of Yehovah and because he has done an outrageous thing in Israel. And this word there, harem, okay, a doomed object, something for destruction, dedicated thing, something to be utterly destroyed. Harem, a word associated with destruction. We see it here in Zechariah 14, 11. To be inhabited for there shall never again be a decree of utter destruction. And the note for the word there, harem, Hebrew term rendered decree of utter destruction refers to things devoted to the Lord for destruction. What did Achan take? I saw a spoil of a beautiful cloak from Sinai, 200 shekels of, and, of gold and a bar weighing 50 shekels, and I coveted them and I took them. These things that were devoted to destruction. So by bringing things devoted to destruction into Israel, he made Israel a thing devoted to destruction. The actions of one man bring in trouble to all Israel, just as Jehovah had warned. And this is a real lesson, isn't it, in the sense of a corporate responsibility that we have as members of Israel. I think very often we see ourselves as being a part of the whole and thereby mindful of the responsibility that that brings. 1 Corinthians 12, 
As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. We are part of something bigger than just us. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honoured, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So, bear that in mind. Leviticus 26 is a listing of blessings and curses and punishments. And the chapter begins, if you follow my laws and faithfully observe my commandments, okay, then we have all the blessings and the curses. But from our English interpretation, we cannot see that the word you is a plural pronoun. So if you, and it's talking to the people, not just you individually, to the people as a whole. Hebrew makes distinctions between the singular and the plural, so the conditional statement that we read in this verse is actually given to the nation as a whole, not to the individual. And this is all to do with the blessings and the curses that will come. So what we read of in Leviticus chapter 26 is a, is a listing of blessings and punishments at the national level. As a result of obedience, the nation will enjoy prosperity in regards to the land's agriculture, political stability, security, and military successes. Uh, echoing what Paul has written. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. No wonder Paul is keen to proclaim the Torah command, purge the evil from your midst. 1 Corinthians 5 says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what do I have to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. One of the main themes in Parsha Shoftim and Parsha Ki Tetzay is put away or purge the evil from among you. And we've got a list of some of the verses that bring it up. It's all different things. Um, a rebellious, a stubborn and rebellious son. There's one example there in Deuteronomy 21.21. 21. In Parsha Re'e, we read, If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass. And if he says, let us go up after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For Yehovah your God is testing you to know whether you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and you shall serve him and hold fast to him. So Yehovah your God is testing you to know whether you love Yehovah your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And it's all to do with will you be obedient? Will you walk in these ways? And these are the tests that come to each and every single one of us. But when we're steadfast under trial, then we're blessed. Then we're like the people in the second generation and not the first. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has taught rebellion against Yehovah your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of slavery to make you leave the way in which Yehovah your God commanded you to walk. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. So read that, to make you leave, to leave behind, to go astray from the way that Yehovah your God commanded you to walk. Okay, to walk in a way that's contrary to the word. Purge that person from your midst. The Lord your God is testing you. And the Lord does not change. I, Yehovah, do not change. Yeshua HaMashiach is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So it's not like he suddenly changed his mind on these things and all that stuff's cool. Again, we see Paul is keen to proclaim the Torah command, purge the evil from your midst. And he says this, I am astonished that you were so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, being led away from the way that Yehovah commanded you in all things. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Twist it to lead you away. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. And we'll see what that actually is saying in a moment. 
As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. And this, what is this? Let him be accursed. Let him be anathema. Man or accused. Cursed. Okay. When Paul says, let him be accursed, he will, as in all his writings, be drawn from Scripture for his definition. We might well read, let him be accursed, and think we have a good take on what is being said. But as we've seen before, when we just read things and take things in the English, we might actually be missing stuff. But until we look at Scripture, we certainly won't get the full and accurate picture of what he's talking about when he says, let him be accursed. Leviticus 27, no devoted thing, it's that word that Paul uses, accursed, that a man devotes to the Lord of anything that he has, whether man or beast or of his inherited field, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy to Jehovah. No one devoted who is devoted for destruction for mankind shall be ransomed, he shall surely be put to death. So there it is, G31, a thing devoted to God, thou hope of being redeemed, something doomed to destruction. Okay, you've probably made the connection now. It's the same word that we find in the Hebrew, cherem, a thing that is devoted to destruction. We looked at before, a doomed object, dead case of thing, something to be exterminated, to utter destruction. Deuteronomy 7, Neither shall thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it. Which is interesting, isn't it? What did the people do when we brought things devoted to destruction, and they actually made Israel a thing to be devoted to destruction. But thou shalt utterly detest it, and thou shalt utterly abort it, for it is a cursed thing. It is something that is devoted to destruction. And as we've seen, it is used in these scriptures that we've just been looking at. The city shall be a cursed. Same word that Paul uses to describe those who would lead you astray. And again, in Joshua seven twelve. The children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. Okay, this word, they were harem. Neither will I be with you anymore except you destroy the accursed thing from among you. Well, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. It's this same word, harem. Let him be devoted to destruction. Paul likens those preaching another gospel to that which is the association in Scripture of an abomination, something that should not be brought into the camp of Israel, something to be utterly detested and utterly abhorred, something to be destroyed. It's about as serious as it gets. This is how Yehovah sees these people. This is how we are to see these people. Very interesting in light of what we read earlier, isn't it? Keep yourselves from these accursed things, these things devoted to destruction. Lest when you have devoted them, you take any of these things, make the camp of Israel a thing devoted to destruction. So don't allow things accursed, devoted to destruction. Harem, or anathema in the Greek. Those who distort the gospel being described as amongst these things. Don't allow these things into Israel, lest Israel becomes devoted to destruction. So what do we see here? Paul sees the danger and calls for us to see those who distort the gospel to be considered in such a way. How serious a matter that it is. You must purge the evil from your midst. Anything that leads us away from Jehovah has to be rooted out and dealt with before it takes root and wreaks havoc and destruction. Anything that causes us not to walk in the way that the Lord has set before us. Please bear in mind what we're reading about is the same Elohim who we know to be compassionate and loving, but he loves his people and he realizes that this is so serious. We need to understand that as a community, we need to protect ourselves against those who would bring upon us the wrath rather than the blessings of Jehovah. The you, plural. We're to exhort one another. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. So, Achan is led away by his desire, and Israel suffers defeat. It is not always the case in Scripture that all Israel suffers for the actions of a few. 
But we have this incident recorded to instruct us that according to Yehovah's righteous judgment, this can most certainly occur. And in the case recorded in Joshua 7, we see that the people were warned. If you bring any of these things devoted to destruction into Israel, these are cursed things, then Israel will be devoted to destruction. Yehovah is righteous and he acts how he sees fit. Just think of the Ark of the Covenant, 2 Samuel 6. Uzzah put out his hand in the ark of, uh, to the Ark of God and took hold of it. For the oxen stumbled and the anger of Jehovah was kindled against Uzzah and God struck him down there because of his error and he died there beside the Ark of God. Okay, he stuck out his hand and he dies. And yet we read in 1 Samuel 4, Philistines fought and Israel was defeated and they fled every man to his home and there was a very great slaughter. For 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel fell and the Ark of God was captured. So the Philistines walk off with the Ark of the Covenant. They don't die like Uzzah who just put his hand up to protect it. But of course, Uzzah knew that what he was doing was wrong. This is a different thing. But again, we know that Yehovah is just and right in all his actions. This story actually continues. And what we read is, when the Philistines captured the Ark of God, they brought it, from, brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. And the Philistines took the Ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it up beside Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, behold, Dagon the fallen face, uh, had fallen face downward on the ground before the Ark of Jehovah. So they took Dagon and they put him back in his place. But when they rose early on the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the Ark of Jehovah. And the head of Dagon... And both his hands were lying cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. This is why the priests of Dagon and all who enter the house of Dagon do not tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod, uh, Ashdod to this day. The hand of Jehovah was heavy against the people of Ashdod and he terrified and afflicted them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. And when the men of Ashdod saw how things were, they said, the ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is hard against us and against Dagon our God. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, What should we do with the ark of the God of Israel? They answered, Let the ark of the God of Israel be brought around to Gath. So they brought the ark of God of Israel there. But after they had brought it around, the hand of Jehovah was against the city, causing a very great panic. And he afflicted the men of the city, both young and old, so that tumors broke out on them. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron. But as soon as the ark of God came to Ekron, the people cried out, they have brought around to us the ark of the God of Israel to kill us and our people. They sent therefore and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it return to its own place that it may not kill us and our people. For there was a deathly panic throughout the whole city. The hand of God was very heavy there. So you can read into this. Okay, Uzzah, he dies. Oh, what's going on there? They, they've just walked away with the ark and they didn't die like that. The man who did not die was struck with tumors and the very cry of the city went up to heaven. Yehovah is sovereign over all creation. He is righteous in all his dealings. The Lord says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares Jehovah. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And of course, his word helps us to see things as he does, and to understand why he does the things that he does. Know therefore today and lay it to your heart that Jehovah is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath, there is no other. Don't try and set yourself up above him. There is none like you, O Yehovah, you are great and your name is great in might. Who would not fear you, O King of the nations, for this is your due for among all the wise ones of the nations and in all the kingdoms, there is none like you. And then, of course, we read this earlier. Whatever Yehovah does, whether we understand it or not, we can be sure that he is righteous in all his dealings. The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice, mishpat, a God of faithfulness, emunah, and without iniquity, he's just, he's righteous, zadik, 
and upright Yeshua is he. And we can be sure of that in all our dealings. That's why you will find when people truly repent in Scripture, they will say things like, Lord, all these evils that have come upon us, you are right in your judgment and in dealing with us this way. The people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. Israel has sinned. They are defeated and 36 men are killed. So he said there are always consequences to sin. So how does that fit in with this? The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Of course, we see things in a very narrow perspective and we just see things in terms of this life and what's happening now and this and that and the other. Verse 4 gives us the context for what we read in Ezekiel 18. Behold, all souls are mine, the soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine, the soul who sins shall die. Okay, now we're starting to see that this might have a different perspective. This might be talking about an eternal perspective. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer, suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. But if a wicked person turns away from all his sins that he has committed and keeps all my statutes and does what is just and right, he shall surely live and he shall not die. So if he repents, he has life. And of course, Yehovah is speaking in terms of life as in eternal life. None of the transgressions he has committed shall be remembered against him for the righteousness that he has done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live, that he should repent and have life. This is the context in which we read these things. When a righteous person turns away from his righteousness and does injustice and does the same abominations that the wicked person does, shall he live? None of the righteous deeds that he has done shall be remembered for the treachery of which he is guilty and the sin he has committed. For them he shall die. Okay. Because he's turned from walking in righteousness. Can you now see why the Lord says it? Anybody who would have you to turn away from walking in all the way that the Lord has commanded you. Let him be accursed. Let him be devoted to destruction. Because we can see what happens when a righteous person stops walking in righteousness. Yet you say the way of the Lord is not just, oh hang on, I don't know about this, I don't like this. Here now, O house of Israel, is my way not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? When a righteous person turns away from his righteousness and does injustice, he shall die for it. For the injustice that he has done, he shall die. That's why we read all the time, finish the race. Okay, Hold your confidence firm to the end. Again, when a wicked person turns away from the wickedness he has committed, when he repents and does what is just and right, he shall save his life. Because he considered and turned away from all the transgressions, all the sins that he committed, the soul that sins shall die. No, he turns away from he shall surely live, he shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord is not just. O house of Israel, oh my way is not just. Is it not your ways that are not just? And it's funny, as now I come across things sometimes like... Um, Articles or thumbnails on videos and stuff, and it'll be, oh, who could, who could, um, who could love and follow a God who this, that, and the other, and oh, and they just take things and they twist them all out of context, and they try to pass judgments, and they're basically saying, oh, the way of the Lord is not just, this isn't right, that's not the way I'd do things. Brother. I just think, wow, how foolish to try and contest against Jehovah. The Lord says, therefore, I will judge you, house of Israel, every one according to his ways declares the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, lest iniquity be your ruin. Okay. Everyone, according to his ways, will be judged. But that's not to say that there will not be consequences for sin. And your sin might cause consequences for somebody else, but in the reckoning of whether you are righteous and whether you will have life, the Lord says, everyone, according to his ways, repent and turn from all your transgressions lest iniquity be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you've committed and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? 
I can hear him saying that to so many people who are alive to this day, who claim to walk in his ways and yet don't. Why will you die? These stiff-necked people who are hard-hearted. I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. So turn and live. Repent. It's the same message that was given when Yeshua came, wasn't it? Repent. Repent and live. Yeshua said, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. I have no pleasure in the death of anyone. And we find this echoed in Second Peter. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Repent and live. And he continues on. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved in the earth, and all the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be resolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Repent and live. Waiting for and hastening the coming day of God. If you walk in righteousness, you wait for this day. This is the day when the trumpet will sound and you will go into victory with your king. Because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And these are the promises that people who trust in Yehovah can really take hold of. And when times are tough, they encourage one another with the promise of that which is to come. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Repent and live. What sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? knowing that these things are coming to pass. It is by living according to his word that we are sanctified, as Yeshua said. He said, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Don't let anybody take you away from walking in all the ways that Yehovah your God has commanded you. I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God, so turn and live. If you've been going the wrong way, then turn. And in the story of the prodigal son, confession, the son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Repentance and then life. The father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe, put it on and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. This is my son. He was dead. Now he's alive again. He was lost and he is found. And they began to celebrate. And to anybody you might have been hard-hearted, stiff-necked. There's an area in their life they're being tested in and maybe that they're not walking in righteousness. Please heed these words. Seek Jehovah while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to Jehovah. Let him repent that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Repent and live. Joshua 8. Jehovah said to Joshua, Do not fear and do not be dismayed. Take all the fighting men with you and arise. Go up to Ai. See how you've given into your hand the king of Ai and his people, his city, and his land. So now we're going to see what happens when the people are obedient and when Jehovah is with them. You shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king, only it's spoiling its livestock. You shall take as plunder for yourselves. You can have the stuff this time. Lay an ambush against the city behind it. So Joshua and all the fighting men arose to go up to Ai, and Joshua chose 30,000 mighty men of valor, and he sent them out by night. And they all looked at, like, <laughs> I, I, I like looking at the pictures. I don't know whether anybody else gets pleasure out of them. <laughs> And he commanded them, Behold, you shall lie in ambush against the city behind it. Do not go very far from the city, but all of you remain ready. And so Joshua details the plan of attack. I and all the people who are with me will approach the city, and when they come out against us just as before, we shall flee before them, like pretend scared. And they will come after us until we have drawn them away from the city, for they will say they are fleeing from us just as before. So we will flee before them. Then you shall rise up from the ambush and seize the city, for Jehovah your God will give it into your hand. So this is the big difference. 
This time, Yehovah will be with them. And as soon as you've taken the city, you shall set the city on fire. You shall do according to the word of Yehovah. See, I have commanded you. This time there will be obedience to the word of Yehovah. That's why there will be victory. So Joshua sent them out and they went out to the place of ambush and lay between Bethel and Ai to the west of Ai. But Joshua spent that night among the people. Joshua arose early in the morning and mustered the people and went up, he and the elders of Israel, before the people to Ai. And all the fighting men who were with him went up and drew near before the city and encamped on the north side of Ai with a ravine between them and Ai. And he took about 5,000 men and set them in ambush between Bethel and Ai to the west of the city. So they stationed the forces, the main encampment that was north of the city and its rear guard west of the city. But Joshua spent that night in the valley. As soon as the king of Ai saw this, he and all his people, the men of the city, hurried and went out early to the appointed place toward the Arabah to meet Israel in battle. But he did not know that there was an ambush against him behind the city. And Joshua and all Israel pretended to be beaten before them and fled in the direction of the wilderness. So all the people who were in the city called together to pursue them. And as they pursued Joshua, they were drawn away from the city to the plan works. Not a man was left in Ai or Bethel who did not go out after Israel. They left the city open and pursued Israel. Then Jehovah said to Joshua, Stretch out the javelin that is in your hand towards Ai, for I will give it into your hand. And Joshua stretched out the javelin that was in his hand toward the city. And the men in the ambush rose quickly out of their place, and as soon as he had stretched out his hand, they ran and entered the city and captured it, and they hurried to set, fire, uh, set the city on fire. So when the men of Ai looked back, behold, the smoke of the city went up to heaven and they had no power to flee this way or that. For the people who fled to the wilderness turned back against the pursuers. And when Joshua and all Israel saw the ambush had captured the city and that the smoke of the city went up, then they turned back and struck down the men of Ai. So they draw them out the city by pretending to flee. Others go in, take the city, burn it. They see it, they go rushing back, and then they turn around, and they've got them completely ambushed. And the others came out from the city against them, so they were in the midst of Israel, some on this side, some on that side, and Israel struck them down until there was uh, left none that survived or escaped. But the king of Ai they took alive, and they brought him near to Joshua. When Israel had finished killing all the inhabitants of Ai in the open wilderness, where they pursued them, and all of them to the very last had fallen by the edge of the sword. All Israel returned to Ai and struck it down with the edge of the sword. And all who fell that day, both men and women, were 12,000, all the people of Ai. But Joshua did not draw back his hand with which he stretched out the javelin until he had devoted all the inhabitants of Ai to destruction. Only the livestock and the spoil of that city Israel took as their plunder according to the word of Yehovah that he commanded Joshua. So Joshua burned I and made it forever a heap of ruins, ruins as it is to this day. And he hanged the king of Ai on a tree until evening. And at sunset, Joshua commanded, and they took his body down from the tree and threw it at the entrance of the gate of the city and raised over it a great heap of stones, which stands there to this day. Of course, that is in accordance with what we read in Deuteronomy. His body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day, for a hanged man is cursed by God shall not defile your land that Yehovah your God is giving you for an inheritance. So this is why he's done what he's done here. Again, there will be those who think that Yehovah is not righteous in his actions. Like, wow, what's going on? Or they will find a way to sanitize the events that we've just read about. To somehow like, oh, hang on, there's got to be something going on. Like, the people were Nephilim mutations who needed to die. There'll be some way of trying to explain why what happened, happened. But we are told why Yehovah's judgment comes on the people. And we also see that his timing is perfect. Genesis 15. Yehovah said to Abraham, Know for a certain your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there. Talking about Egypt. They will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve. Okay, he's a righteous judge. And afterwards they should come out with great possessions. And we know they did. They came out with all the silver and gold. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You should be buried in a good old age. 
And they, these people, they shall come here in the fourth generation. So they're going to come back to the land. When are they going to come back? In the fourth generation. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Okay. So that was what was bringing judgment on these people. Their iniquity. It is because of the iniquity that judgment comes to these people. And we know that judgment will come to the whole world for the same reason. Because of iniquity. Behold, the day of Jehovah comes cruel with wrath and fierce anger to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. Okay? This is Jehovah, judge of all the world. I will bring distress on mankind so that they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against Jehovah. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. And this is coming. And in light of this, Paul writes, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. That is, if you are somebody who was submitted to him and surrender to him. Not, this is not to the stiff-necked and the hard-hearted. Those who, when tested, just wander off the track a bit. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. All these things that we read about should cause us to have great hope. In Scripture, it says, encourage one another with these words and thoughts of what is coming. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. And judgment with regards to those who distort the gospel. Certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. They are hidden reefs at your love feast as they feast with you without fear. Shepherds or pastors feeding themselves waterless clouds is a description of something that is evil. It's something that doesn't fulfill its purpose. A cloud should have water. These are waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn. Again, something that's wicked, twice dead and uprooted. Wild waves of the sea casting up the phone of their own shame. Wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are the reasons why judgment will come. For all those who would try and sanitize Jehovah, don't bother. It's straightforward in the scripture. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loudmouthed boasters showing favoritism to gain advantage. Okay, grumblers, malcontents, following their own desires. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Just think of the first generation. And the partial ends with the building of the altar in accordance with Deuteronomy 27. Okay, and this is the region that we'll be looking at for it to be happening. We've got Mount Abel. And Mount Gerizim. And I pointed out in the past that Mount Ebal is just generally speaking is just full of stones and there's nothing really alive there. Whereas Mount Gerizim, the place of blessing, there's trees and there's vegetation and life. So Joshua 8. At that time Joshua built an altar to Jehovah, the God of Israel, on Mount Ebal, just as Moshe the servant of Jehovah had commanded the people of Israel, and it is written in the book of the Lord of Moshe Moshe. An altar of uncut stones upon which no man is wielded an iron tool. And they offered on it burnt offerings to Jehovah and sacrificed peace offerings. And there in the presence of the people of Israel, he wrote on the stones a copy of the law of Moshe, which he had written. So, again, a demonstration of obedience from these people. So the first act upon entering the promised land is to set up stones of remembrance and write on them the Torah. Interesting when we read 1 Peter 2.5. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, making spiritual corbin approaches 
acceptable to the Eternal One and Messiah Yeshua. Of course, <coughs> all these stones built together, held in place, big stones by middle stones and little stones, all stones needed for strength and security. We are all members of one another. The stones of the altar have not been hewn by a human hand. It is Jehovah who moulds us, and we're all unique. The stones are covered with Torah, so you might say that our covering is Torah. Is the thing that binds us together. Is what the world should see when they look at us, are people that declare Jehovah's truth. This covering stops the enemy from coming along and picking away any stones and bringing the whole thing down. And of course, those not under the covering will not last. So the Torah was written on plaster, which was a limestone wash made from crushed stones, and the plaster is soft. Where else is the Torah written? Somewhere soft. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Jehovah. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. No more hard hearts. And all Israel sojourned as well as native born with their elders and officers and the judges stood on opposite sides of the ark before the Levitical priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of Jehovah, half of them in front of Mount Gerizim and half of them in front of Mount Ebal, just as Moshe the servant of Jehovah had commanded at the first to bless the people of Israel. And afterward he read all the words of the law, the blessing and the curse, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moshe commanded that Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel and the women and the little ones and the sojourners who lived among them. Again, obedience to the word so in finishing <clears throat> joshua was a good leader israel served jehovah all the days of joshua we even see his legacy and all the days of the elders who outlived joshua and had known all the work that jehovah did for israel trying times came you see he's there with caleb and all the other people were saying, oh no, it's too scary, we can't go in. But he wholly followed Jehovah. And he kept good company, as we said, right the way through. And here we see him with Caleb and the two of them rent their clothes. They were upset, they were broken hearted at what they saw, just like the people in Ezekiel 9 were, the people who were sealed. Of course, he keeps good company. We know that he that walks with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. He was careful about the company he kept, and he was steadfast. And as we said before, if you put yourself in his position, he was to take over from Moshe. How daunting. He was to lead the nation into battle and to take the land. It really is a thing to think about. If you're just like, have a moment and think, what would that actually be like? He was no doubt daunted by the task that Jehovah gave him. But he was encouraged time and time again. It is Jehovah who goes before you. He will be with you. We will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Shall not fear them. It is Jehovah your God who fights for you. When things are challenging, the message is the same to us as it was to Joshua and the people of the second generation. Be strong and courageous. Be sure of your convictions. Be steadfast. The Lord says, I am with you. The Lord says, you are not alone. It doesn't matter what it is that you're going through. Joshua trusted Jehovah. He had faith. And so he was able to enter into the promises of Jehovah, to enter into victory. Faith bringing victory. We saw that even with Moshe's hands being held up in the air. And the word used there is emunah, faith, often translated as steadfast. Shout, for Jehovah has given you the city. Victory. And of course, but all those people who walk in righteousness, who look to the return of the Messiah, we can shout too. What then should we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? 
I hope that by looking at these chapters, we've been encouraged to look forward to the day that Yeshua will lead us into the promises and into victory. Because we're to encourage one another with these things. And I hope we all trust Yehovah, that we all wait on him. Trust in Yehovah forever, for Yehovah God is an everlasting rock. We can rely on him. Blessed is the nation whose God is Yehovah, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. That's us, all members of one another. And our heart is glad in him. Why? Because we trust in his holy name, his wonderful character. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the promises that are in your word. And I thank you for the warnings that are in your word too. And Lord, I pray for anybody who's listening to this who might not be walking steadfastly, who might not be of good courage. I pray, Lord, that they would be convicted, that they would repent and that they would live. I thank you for your word, Lord. I thank you for opening our eyes to your truth that we can see it. I thank you for the faith um, that you instill in us when we read your word and when we obey it and when we walk according to it. I thank you for all your commandments, for the path that you've set us on. And I thank you for each other, Lord, for the fact that we are members of one another. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to encourage one another. I pray for all those people who might be feeling isolated and, and a bit alone and a bit lost. And Lord, I just pray that they would be encouraged too. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this Sabbath. Thank you for the feasts that are coming up. And I thank you, Lord, for bringing Brandon and Keith all the way over from America so they could be with us. Thank you, Lord, and bless your holy name.